Welcome to Understanding EEG. Episode 1, Introduction to EEG. I'm Jake McKay, Board Certified Neurologist and Neurophysiologist. Hi, and thank you for viewing Understanding EEG. I have designed these lectures specifically for the Neurology Residency Program in Addis Ababa. This is, of course, due to my planned travels being canceled due to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. I hope you are all doing well. While I'm very sorry I could not attend in person this year, luckily the miracles of modern technology will allow me to present these lectures to you remotely. I hope these lectures will be useful for you, but also feel free to share them with any other neurologist or EEG technologist. The drawings in these lectures are my own, and the PowerPoint 3D models, of course, are property of Microsoft, but licensed for use. Please let me know if you have any questions by way of email, which will be provided, or through WhatsApp if you have my username. Without further ado, let's get to it. Introduction to EEG covers the basic biophysics and technological underpinnings of EEG. Gaining an understanding of how EEG signals are generated and recorded will pay off later when we discuss distinguishing physiologically generated brain waves from artifact. Much like any field of data analysis, the more you understand of how that data is generated, the better off you'll be. It is important to be principled in the way you approach EEG reading. Principles become absolutely critical once you are faced with a challenging EEG that is distinct from something that you have encountered before. As you learn to read, you will constantly be refining your very own principles of analysis. The first principle of this lecture, partly due to the name of the series, is understand, do not memorize. The more the reader understands how and why various EEG patterns are generated, the less likely they will be fooled into an incorrect interpretation. EEG is dynamic and full of artifact. An over-reliance on pattern memorization alone will predispose the reader to misinterpretation. Principle two is be a principled reader. This could have easily been number one, if not for the title of the series. However, as you become more experienced in reading EEG, you will encounter a wide variety of interpretations which may be assigned to the same EEG by different readers. Strong principles of interpretation will allow you to defend your own interpretation against others. The basis of EEG is that the brain is composed of neurons which together generate an electrical field when they fire synchronously. Hans Berger, a famous German neurophysiologist, invented the first electroencephalography machine in 1924. That's why he's so famous. EEG records electrical fields of the brain using electrodes. Hans Berger initially used a couple of electrodes when recording human brainwave activity. However, he did rapidly identify that there was a posteriorly predominant rhythm in adult human brains, which he termed the alpha rhythm. Over the subsequent approximately 100 years, our knowledge of EEG has greatly grown, and we now know much more regarding abnormal and normal brain waves. However, there still remains much to be discovered. Neurons are the fundamental generators of EEG signals. We will delve into how this happens more later in this lecture. For now, let's acquaint ourselves with the fundamental components of a neuron. The soma, or cell body, is where all the machinery and organelles of the neuron lie. The axon is what transmits signals to other neurons. However, dendrites are what receives the signals and they vastly outnumber axons for almost all neurons. Let's talk about neuron synapses. 
Synapses are the point where two nerve cells communicate through the axon of one and the dendrite of another. I drew a bit of a diagram here for you, and so you will see that there are vesicles here that are carrying neurotransmitter, the little blue dots I drew, and as neurotransmitter is released, it binds to receptors, which then leads to an influx of sodium ions. As millions of these synapses fire synchronously, the electrical fields of EEG are demonstrated. We will continue to delve into that as we move forward in this lecture. I'd like to discuss the biophysics with regard to dipole moments. Dipole moments are when two charges are separated by a distance but have a net charge of zero. So what does that mean in practice? Well, essentially, if you think of this white orb being a net charge of zero, but then you stretch out a positive component from it that's equal to a negative component, the net charge of this whole thing here is still zero, but yet now you have a positive end interacting with a negative end. Now that you understand dipole moments, let's talk about neuron arrangement before we go any further. The pyramid neurons are the most active neurons when it comes to generating an electrical field that can be detected by EEG. Pyramid neurons have cell bodies that are in cortical layer 5. However, they have long branching dendrites which synapse with other nerve fibers which cross. And so the interaction of branching axons with the apical dendrites of pyramidal cells or the dendrites which are oriented towards the skull causes a separation of charge to occur within the pyramidal cells. Excitatory potentials at the apical dendrite arriving from a nearby axon will actually cause the generation of a sink, which is caused by a rush of the positive ions, as we talked about in the synapse, calcium are positive ions, which will then pass through into the actual dendrite creating a net negative charge here outside the apical dendrite. This rush of positive charge creates a separation in charge where there is a sink or negative area, but also a source in the soma region. Conversely, an excitatory potential that affects the soma will cause the opposite, where you actually have a sink occur at the soma or a rush of positive um, ions here, and then a source or positive net charge here at the apical dendrite in comparison. And when we talk about positive or negative, we're actually talking about the area outside of the cell, right? So the, the area is being picked up by everything else. This is due to the fact that synapses are the main contributors to the neuronal dipoles or electrical fields which are generated. Inhibitory potentials do essentially the reverse of the excitatory. This is the most important example that will be something you might be asked about in the future, frankly. So if you have an inhibition along the proximal part of the apical dendrite, that will cause the reverse of what we talked about before. So you'll have the positive ions which will exit, causing more positive here relative to the more negative distal apical dendrite. So you have all of these millions of neurons firing in synchrony, which together generate an electrical field by summating up the impact of all these dipoles which have been generated. Another important biophysics concept is electric potential. The amount of energy to move a positive charge counter to an electrical field is essentially the definition of electric potential. The positive end is pulled towards the negative end naturally, probably not breaking news to anybody. However, when you hold the positive end far away from the negative, then there is stored potential energy, right? It's just like if you have a rubber band and you stretch it out. Well, when you release it, you release that stored energy. It's the same concept with electric potential so voltage, a concept which is used frequently in EEG, is the difference in electrical potentials between two points. 
EEG measures voltage fluctuation or changes. EEG always compares two electrodes or electric potentials, which is a process known as differential amplification. So we'll get into why this is more important for EEG later, but you almost never are just measuring from a, a single point in EEG. You're always measuring from two points. We will come back to that concept. A basic understanding of how electrodes work will allow us to understand how these electrical fields and electric potentials can be recorded and then subsequently interpreted as EEGs. EEG electrodes allow for the lead wires to interface with the scalp. Keratin and the oils of the skin are natural insulators, so you have to scrub the skin to get rid of these the best you can, and then you use a chloride electrolyte gel, which will help improve current flow. The electrolyte gel or electrode paste results in an electrical double layer, causing electrical charges to line up at the boundary between the gel and the electrode. It also creates capacitance. This helps increase the flow of ionic current and creates a stable interface for which the signals of the brain can be transferred to ionic currents within the wire. It's important to note that silver, silver chloride electrodes are stable and resistant to polarization. So essentially the electrode itself doesn't become overly polarized and this allows for this signal to then be accurately transmitted to the lead wires. So since the EEG electric potentials are small, the signals are then subsequently amplified or increased in voltage by an amplifier later in the signal chain. It's important to keep in mind just how small the electrical potential of the regions of the brain we are measuring truly are. This is especially true when you compare that electrical potential to the electrical potential of the eyeballs, the tongue, machines in the environment, all the other things we'll talk about later. Nonetheless, you have to amplify the signal that you ultimately obtain from the brain in order to make it something that you can interpret. Electrodes have a property termed impedance. It is represented by the letter Z and signifies the opposition to current flow. Electrodes as well as amplifiers have a property of capacitance. Impedance has an ideal value when the electrode is appropriately fixed to the scalp. And that value is between 100 ohms and five kilo ohms. This is very important to obtain a reliable signal. Of note, impedance goes down as frequency or capacitance increases. This will come into play later when we talk a bit more about filtering. Differential amplification is a process where we compare one electrode to another. All EEG interpretation relies upon this principle. Why is this? It's because the overall electrical potential being measured at a given point in the brain is extremely low compared to the electrical noise in the environment. By comparing one electrode to another, we can essentially filter out the background noise as the background noise is about the same in both the electric electrodes being compared. So what we are left with is the part that's different between the two electrodes. Here is a practical schematic of this. So when we talk about background noise, think of that as this gray area. So if we're comparing E1 to E2, then we have E2 plus the background noise minus E1 plus the background noise. And what we're left with is just E2 minus E1. So the background noise cancels out because it's about the same in both of these electrodes. Electrodes have to be placed in a standardized way in order for us to give meaning to our recordings. The 1020 system is the most common placement system, which is from the Nasion to the Indian. Pronunciation, perhaps incorrect with the Indian. The letter of each electrode stands for approximately where it is on the brain. So FP is frontopolar, 
F is frontal, V is vertex, P is parietal, and O is occipital. The even numbers are on the right and the odd numbers are on the left, whereas the central letters have Z affixed to them as a subscript. So when we place these electrodes, they're predictively placed with essentially you measure the entire scalp from the nasion to the inion, so that's 100%, and then you do 10% distance up to FP1, and then 20 from there to FP3, 20 from there to the vertex, 20 from there to parietal, and then 20 from there to the, the occiput or occipital electrodes, and then 10% to the inion. So this standardized way of placing the electrodes allows us to roughly know where we're, we're recording. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to interpret from one lab to another. There are certain ways that electrodes are compared to one another, which are very commonly used. The most common montage, which is a system of how these electrodes are compared, is the anterior to posterior bipolar montage. In this system, each electrode is compared to a nearby electrode. The process of differential amplification, as we talked about before, is utilized in every montage. So there's always a comparison of one electrode to another. The referential montage is where all the electrodes are individually compared to a single reference electrode. So they're all compared to the same reference electrode, or the same one other electrode. I'll show you graphically what this means. Here we have a drawing of an AP bipolar montage or anterior to posterior bipolar montage. So essentially, this is also called a double banana montage because of the way the electrodes are com compared to one another. You have the frontopolar electrodes here, FP1, which then are compared in different chains. There's a temporal chain which compares FP1 to F7, then to T3 or temporal 3, and then to T5, which is the posterior temporal, and then to the occipital. Or O1. Then you also have a parasagittal chain, which is FP1 compared to F3, and then compared to C3, then C3 to P3, and P3 to O1. And then you have a central chain, which is FC compared to CZ compared to PZ. So all of these electrodes are being compared to a very nearby electrode. So this is the most common way that someone would look at a normal EEG. However, there will come times where it's useful to get a different vantage point. The next most common montage utilized is a referential montage. In this system, every electrode is compared to a single point or maybe two different points. A lot of times, people compare one side to an ear electrode and then the other side to an ipsilateral ear electrode or vice versa. You might compare the whole right side to the left ear electrode and the whole left side to the right ear electrode. This is really useful when you're trying to figure out where an air, a waveform is maximal because the highest amplitude would be the area where it's maximal with a referential montage. When we look at an EEG, it's very important to be oriented to what the settings of the EEG are. There are a lot of different settings that need to be viewed. So I'll take you through them here. The first thing to do when looking at an EEG is to establish what type of montage you're reading. Is it an AP bipolar or is it a, re a referential montage? The next thing to do is to check your filters. A low frequency filter should be set at one hertz for a normal value and the high frequency filter should be set at 70 hertz. I really recommend you make your first pass through of an EEG using these normal frequency filter settings. The sensitivity is seven microvolts per millimeter on a normal EEG. When you increase sensitivity, you actually have less microvolts per millimeter because that's meaning it's more, sen more sensitive. You're seeing basically things get bigger on the EEG when you, dec when you decrease the amount of microvolts per millimeter that you're displaying because every millimeter is displaying e even, even more of the signal than it was before. Hopefully that makes sense. The time base is very important to look at as well. 30 millimeters per second is the normal time base. 15 millimeters per second will display 
more seconds on the same screen, essentially twice as many. This can be useful when trying to get a vantage point over time, but 30 millimeters per second is the normal setting. So let's look at an EEG here. So if we're looking at the settings, you see that the first thing is the montage. So we are looking at an AP bipolar montage. The parasagittal chains are on top, left over right, then the central chain in the middle, then the left temporal over the right temporal chains. Also, when you look at the low frequency filter, it's at one hertz. The high frequency filter is at 70 hertz. The notch filter is particular to AC current, but will essentially remove this frequency which is common to AC current from the record. Sensitivity is set here at 10 microvolts per millimeter. It's important to note that this is not a normal sensitivity when you start the record. It doesn't really change your interpretation, but it might if you thought, hey, this is a low voltage recording, because you might be mistaken because the sensitivity is too low. The time base is a normal 30 millimeters per second. So let's talk about the signal chain involved in a typical EEG recording setup. You have to get these signals recorded from the brain as we talked about using an electrode. As you see below here, this gray electrode over the surface of the brain, picking up the electric potentials generated by the dipole moments of the pyramidal neurons in cortical layer five. This signal generates ionic flow in the wire, which transmits a signal to the amplifier, which then increases that signal. And then the signal is sent through several filters, and then an analog to digital converter, and then it's sent to the actual computer, where there is admittedly much digital post-processing with today's digital EEGs. So now I would like to talk a bit about the filtering that goes on to the raw EEG signal. There is a low frequency filter, which is essentially an analog circuitry, a capacitor. Capacitors will block low frequencies more than high frequencies or filter them out of the signal. They're also called a high pass filter because they pass the high frequencies through unaffected while filtering out the low frequencies or the slow frequencies. So essentially the equation you can think of, which does come up on board exams, is that the impedance of a capacitor is equal to one over two pi times the frequency times the capacitance. This entails that the higher the frequency is, the less opposition to current flow there is for a given capacitor. So a visual graphic of a signal chain may be this. There's an AC signal input, which is coming to the capacitor. This blocks some of the low frequencies which then means that the frequency that goes to the output has more high frequencies than low frequencies compared to this original signal. The graphical logarithmic representation of this is as follows. You see here that as the frequency increases, there is a higher gain being passed through this capacitor. The high frequency filter is essentially just the reverse of the capacitor circuit that we just discussed. Instead of filtering out the low frequencies, it's filtering out the high frequencies. Well, the impedance is a, for a resistor is equal to the resistance. So what happens is you have an AC signal, right? And it comes through this resistor and it comes through here more or less the same components of the fast frequencies and slow frequencies, but then there's a choice it has to make. Is it going to go to the output or pass through to the ground? Well, the capacitor stands in the way of it getting to the ground. So what does the capacitor do? It blocks slow frequencies. So the slow frequencies are blocked from this path and must go out the output while the high frequencies are happy to go out towards the ground. So you end up filtering out the high frequencies and passing through the low frequencies. This can be graphically represented again in a logarithmic fashion here, where you see that there becomes a point where the higher the frequency is, the less gain or the less of the signal is getting through and it drops off quite precipitously.
when we talk about EEG frequencies, whether or not something's slow or fast probably doesn't mean a lot to you at this stage of your EEG learning. However, we've codified what frequencies are called with EEG. So slower frequencies are delta frequencies, and those are less than four hertz or less than four cycles per second. Theta frequencies are four to eight hertz, or basically four to eight cycles per second. Alpha is eight to 13 hertz, and beta is greater than 13 hertz. Essentially, if a waveform is eight or 13, then it falls as alpha. So that's the one where it's really, if it's equal to or greater than or equal to or less than, it, it is alpha if it's in the alpha range. With that knowledge in mind, there's a box around some frequencies here. How many cycles per second do you see? I see about nine to 10. What range would that put this frequency in? Would it be delta, theta, alpha, beta? Well, if you thought alpha, you'd be right. Conversely, how about this? This looks a good bit slower, huh? I see about 1.5 to 2 hertz here in terms of the cycles per second. So where would this frequency lie? Would it be delta, theta, alpha, or beta? If you thought delta, you'd be correct. Now that you understand frequency with regards to EEG, let's talk about direction, positive or negative deflections. So this is not very intuitive, so it really helps to understand, not memorize this. If you have a positive deflection, then the first electrode is relatively more positive than the second. However, in the EEG terms, this results in a downward deflection. This might be the opposite of what you would expect intuitively. One way I like to memorize this is to think of a Cartesian coordinate system. And if I think of electrode one as positive, then it would be up, whereas electrode two is negative, then it would be down, and that would cause a downward slant that points downward. The other way you may memorize this is if you think of it as E1 is the name and E2 is the direction if it's downward. I don't really like that as much because it's more memorization, less understanding, but it may be a shortcut as you get started. So conversely, we are gonna talk about a negative deflection. So in a negative deflection, the first electrode is more relatively negative than the second. And again, using a Cartesian system is the easiest to me to understand this and, and really ingrain it in your memory. So it, electrode one, if it's negative, it would be downward in a Cartesian system and electrode two would be upward and that would point up. So a negative deflection actually is going to deflect upwards on the EEG. So now we talk about phase reversals, which are the next step when you understand positive or negative deflection terminology. So a negative phase reversal is when the two waveforms come towards each other like you see below. One way I like to think of this is you can put a negative signal between it. Positive phase reversals are when the deflections go apart from one another. I like to think of this, you could put a plus sign in between them. I'll show you why these occur in the next slide. So if you're comparing three different electrodes, so the first comparison would be comparing E1 to E2. So if you think of the red area as negatively charged relative to the green, then you are comparing E1 to E2, then E2 to E3. So the first electrode comparison here would have a positive deflection, but it would actually go down, right? Because it's going to go the, down the, relative to the opposite of what you might expect. Whereas the second comparison would have a negative deflection or go up. So what this results in is negative polarity of the charge where the 
two waveforms actually come together, as you see here, you could fit a negative sign in between it. Well, here we'll show you what it means if you have a positive charge that's in the middle of this chain of electrodes being compared. So the first E1 to E2 comparison would be a negative deflection, and it would actually go upwards. When comparing E2 to E3, however, we have a positive deflection, with the first electrode being more positive than the second, and the deflection of the waveform is downward. Together, we have a positive polarity waveform when we sum these results up. So that was a lot of information and somewhat difficult introductory concepts. I will now ask you several questions regarding this material. My goal is to ingrain the most important bits of the information in your memory banks. Question one, who invented the EEG? This is a question that will come up a lot. Was it Tom Pleck, Hans Berger, Warner Heisenberg, or Max Planck? I'll give you three seconds. Well, if you answered Hans Berger, you'd be correct. Tom Pleck I made up, and the other two names are famous German physicists. Question two. Where are the electrical potentials measured by EEG primarily located? The neuron cell body, axons, neuron to neuron synapses. I'll give you three seconds. If you answered neuron to neuron synapses, you would be correct. Question three. What is the system used for electrode distance placement? The International 1020 System, the World Health Organization 1015 System, or the International 1015 System? I'll give you three seconds. If you answered the International 1020 System, you would be correct. Question four. In which montage system is the maximal amplitude the area that is the highest voltage? If you were listening carefully before, you might remember this. Is it transverse montages, referential montages, or anterior to posterior bipolar montages? I'll give you three seconds. If you answered referential montages, you would be correct. The area of maximal amplitude in an AP bipolar montage is actually the area of phase reversal, typically. Now, I would like you to look at the EEG below that's contained within that box. What is the range of the frequency highlighted below? Is it delta, theta, alpha, or beta? If you answered alpha, you would be correct. Question six. If the first electrode is more positive relatively than the second one, so a positive deflection, which direction will the deflection go? Downward, upward, or isoelectric, meaning flat? If you answered downward, you would be correct. Again, just to review, I like to use this Cartesian system that I made up when I was in my fellowship to help me mentally process this. But if you want to just memorize it and you can, this is one aspect you can probably get away with memorization. Question seven, which of the below waveforms represents a discharge that is positive polarity? A or B? I'll give you three seconds. If you answered B, you would be correct. Remember that the positive polarity can be represented by a plus sign fitting in between the two waveforms which go apart from one another. Here are the references I used when making this presentation. Dr. Tatum was my main mentor and his excellent handbook of EEG interpretation is something that you can carry around with you in your white coat pocket and is useful during all stages of EEG education. I would consider Stern Atlas of EEG Patterns to be an excellent starter atlas as well. I'm not paid by any of these authors, so take this endorsement as you will. 
So that's it for episode one of Understanding EEG. This is a lecture you may want to return to several times in the future in order to continually reinforce these fundamental concepts. Now that you have the heavy lifting down though, we will finally get to the fun part next episode when I cover normal awake and sleep EEG. Next episode, we will begin to ride the waves of EEG together. Until then, 